We're delighted to celebrate Racial Melancholia, Racial Disassociation by David Ang and Shin Hee Han, who are two old friends of the workshop. The book is for sale at the back, and I encourage you to buy it and get it signed. So uh, maybe to start with the more official bio stuff, so David is the Robert L. Fisher Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania, and Shin Hee is a therapist who has a practice in New York and who teaches at the New School. But none of this sort of expresses the long relationship that they've had with the workshop as people who've been involved uh, with this space for more than a decade. Um, in fact, uh, I think possibly the first event I came to as executive director at the workshop was like 11 years ago and involved the three of them. And <laughs> it was a private book party for Min Jin Lee's first book. Um, and I, th I think I perhaps had not even started my job yet, but it was a miraculous moment to meet these three figures, the third being Holly Lee. Uh, and I remember that, um, so at the time, David was a board member of the workshop, and he predated me, and Shin Hee had been a longtime supporter. And I remember that, um, you know, for example, like meeting David and Shin Hee uh, and Holly, it was really transformative because, I, I don't know if any of you relate to this, but um, coming from an immigrant family where everything uh, you know, has certain careerist uh, status related aspirations, um, meeting them was one of the first times I'd met Asian American grown-ups who seemed like fulfilled and had curiosity and a sense of humor and uh, you know, read books and things like that. So it was sort of like this life-changing moment because I thought, oh, like I could have a future self that is not marked by aggressive silences to my children. Um, <laughs> speaking for a friend, not, not for me. <laughs> um, and I was actually talking about that moment the other day um, when Min Jin and I were having lunch and we were talking about this book and she was saying, you know, you and I, being Generation X, we're our parents were part of the survivor generation where uh, being immigrants, they had to make it in this country. Um, but you and I, we're part of the meaning generation, where our task is to live in the wake of the survivors who came before us and produce some kind of meaning from that wreckage. And that actually is a, a great summary of what this book is about. It's a way of negotiating what are the costs of that task of producing meaning, of living in the wake and having a debt to someone who has sacrificed for you. And I suspect from the, the, the respectful <laughs> silences that many people in this room relate to this. Um, one way of naming that cost is actually melancholia, um, which is a pathology that was famously articulated by Freud as a state of permanent mourning, where you have an object that can never be recovered. But melancholia is also, one might say, the state of what it means to be a romantic poet, and sort of an emotion that was valorized uh, 200 years ago as the emotion of lyric subjectivity. And the book is sort of about recapturing melancholia, not as a dysfunction of an individual, but as a consequence of what it means to be a racialized subject in this country, specifically an Asian American. Um, and just as melancholia is also a property of the poet, the book recaptures this term through Asian American literature and literature by other writers of color like Danzy Senna and Toni Morrison, and tries to understand you know, in what way do novels articulate the experience of melancholia or dissociation? How can creative production help us understand these things? The cost of melancholia, again, is not just a personal psychological issue. It's something that has to do with political problems. And so the book is one of the more nuanced books I've read about articulating what the cost of what it means be, to be Asian American. I think there's a constant uh, struggle to articulate the identity of Asian Americans within a black-white dichotomy. Uh, to push back against model minority stereotypes while also acknowledging what Asians have in this country. And the book is one of the more nuanced accounts of the specific kind of psychodynamic exclusions that Asian Americans have to suffer from, where melancholia is a lost object created by the loss of racial citizenship, by being excluded, by losing an object that might be either assimilation or your mother tongue or your mother country. Um, and the cost of being a modern minority, not just being not having everything going your way economically, but just not having the ability to have a full, healthy, lovely, funny, creative self. Um, how many people in this room can relate to anything that I've said so far? <laughs> um, so Shin Hee will be charging by the hour after <laughs> this. Um, no, in 15-minute <laughs> in increments, you'll get an invoice. 
Um, so a lot, a lot of this goes back to literature. There's a lot in the book I haven't said, including her, uh, their analysis of the next generation, which is through dissociation. Um, but reading the book, I was struck by how much uh, I could think of so many themes in authors who've read in this space recently, like in Fatima Askar's new book where she talks about intergenerational trauma and how the, something like the partition can have a scar that affects someone you know, many generations later. Or a short story like Jenny Zong's Pity Our Errors, um, Pity Our Sins, where she, it's sort of like a, an attempt to have a rapprochement with the mother who sacrificed everything for you. Um, I think you can relate to most of what I'm talking about, and I'm really glad to have David and Shin He in our space. Um, before they start, um, I want to once again thank the Asian Women Giving Circle, which is co-sponsoring this event and has been a longtime funder of the workshop. Uh, they're a great supporter of uh, art and activism by Asian American women, so a lot of you in this room might be interested in applying. Um, but Holly is an old friend of the workshop and of David and Shin He, so she'll say a few things about the Giving Circle, and also hopefully embarrass our speakers. Let's give her a hand. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Ken Chen. Um, my husband, Peter, was a board member of the Writers' Workshop kind of around the same time as David Eng. I felt like as David was talking, I should have been the person with the props. Like, you can get your book signed <laughs> by David and Shin -hee, right back there. And that time when we met David, when Minjin was doing her talk, at Union Square, the Barnes & Noble at Union Square, Ken Chen was brand new in the job. He had a whiskey in one hand. This is outdoors by the mailbox in front of Union Square Cafe. I'd like a triple espresso <laughs> and a whiskey. <laughs> and we showed up and we're like, sweetie, you doing okay? God, jeez. I'm, I'm super excited for you guys for, to hear myself from these d dear friends of mine and all of ours, um, this brilliant combination of theory and practice of fancy um, academic pedigree people combined with um, real live his history and on the ground cl clinical case studies. Um, this book is a combination of race theory plus psychoanalytic thought like filtered through the minds of two really smart people who have live practices on the ground and who are also just very menschy, to borrow a word from another culture. Um, you can read about their pedigrees and bios here and also online, um, but I thought I would share a couple of tidbits with you just about them as people. It's not gonna be too bad, shin he. Um, before I get there, um, quickly about the Asian Women Giving Circle, it's been our great pleasure to get to fund the Writer's Workshop, I think six or seven times in our 13-year history. We're a group of all-volunteer um, Asian-American women. We've moved over a million dollars now um, to fund Asian-American women in New York City who are using the tools of arts and culture to bring about equitable social change in their communities. We have two steering three steering committee members in the room, Julie Kim, Aeyang Choi, Shin He is a founding member, as is Aeyang and I. So if you have any questions about what we do, please get hold of us. We are in the middle of our um, grant cycle right now. We do one a year, so if you're interested in applying, definitely reach out to one of us. Um, it's a pleasure to get to do this with you, Ken Chen. Um, so a couple things about David and Shin He. They can both swim two miles in a row at the same time. They are. Ex think about that, like in a pool, in la doing laps. Okay, one and two. Okay, one mile. Well, you know, I hero worship them, so I doubled it. Um, they're excellent cooks and devoted uncles and parents. They are dear and loyal friends with a posse of radical Asian American organizers and progressives across the United States, and occasionally they yodel. not going to yodel tonight. And you may sound like maybe we're married, but we're actually not <laughs> married or anything like that. So I just want to begin by thanking Holly and Ken. The Asian American Writers Workshop is such a special place. Um, it really holds a special place in my heart. I was a board member in the mid-1990s, and we were not in this beautiful space today. We were in the basement of um, The Gap. So I don't know, for those of you who are kind of old, on, on 2nd Avenue and 8th Street, there used to be a gap. And we were under the gap, and you had to go, walk through the gap 
to get to the writer's workshop and you could like buy underwear and t-shirts and then go to a reading for an Asian, of an Asian American writer. It was very special, um, but the Asian American writer's workshop was never really supposed to happen, especially in New York City. An organization like this, you would maybe expect to be in New York City, uh, not be in California, not in New York City. And I just think it's been amazing that a string of directors now with Ken um, have sustained this place and made it such a vibrant and welcoming community. Shinny and I have done four talks uh, in New York City, and this is the first time that we've had such a young audience and almost entirely Asian American audience. And that's something that's really special. Even back that way back when, um, my memory's going, but what I found so amazing about the workshop is that Asian Americans are are socialized to be colorblind. They're socialized to be compliant. We talk about this. And so, and they're socialized to be apolitical in many ways. And so I was constantly amazed at seeing a stream of young people coming through the workshop and kind of becoming politicized through their interests and attention to culture. And I feel like that that is something that makes the Writers' Workshop such a special place. I did not realize that now they're bandanas. I'm very excited. I want a bandana. I'll, I'll wear it during question and answer if you can produce one. Um, but I, I do want to thank uh, Ken for that wonderful introduction, for sustaining the workshop over all these years. Um, I don't quite remember the story about Min Jim, but I'm glad that you, you, you described us as three adults as opposed to like <laughs> three witches on the heath. I had this image of Macbeth. Um, with the, especially with the three of us. But anyway, um, let me turn it over to Shinhee for her thanks, and then we'll get into the talk. So I don't remember that, but I remember meeting Ken, and Ken asked me, what brought you to New York? And I said, I came because of love. And I think he was really, you were very surprised. And then I proceeded to fall in love with Ken. So the story goes now. So he was my young boyfriend until he became a father. Um, <laughs> um, so I want to thank Ken and also um, Holly Lee. Um, as Holly mentioned that she is the founder of Asian Women Giving Circle. Uh, we are a team of volunteer kick-ass ladies, uh, ages between 25 to 75 or so. 79! Hey. Um, who have been raising money to fund Asian American women artists who are doing kick-ass um, social justice and social activism. And I mention this because Holly gave birth to it. And now she's moved, she's also now encompassed to move people of color donors to be the philanthropists. And so this is a movement that Holly has given birth to and that we are all on this journey with her to really do important political and cultural work. Um, so I want to thank her. And just briefly, um, our talk is timed for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to take Q&A for another 30 minutes. And then um, David is going to tell us a story of how we met and how the book came about. And then I'm going to make some observations about Asian American mental health and the clinic. And then I'm going to read an excerpt, very short a story of a gay parachute kid. And then David is going to end with a critical commentary. <laughs> You know, we're being live streamed. I just love that. Neither, neither of us are on social media, and I love the idea that there are millions of Asian people like watching us on a live stream. <laughs> All right, so, um, <laughs> so let me tell you, um, I don't, that was like, see, I told you, I'm surprised it wasn't witches as opposed to like adults. Um, so let me talk about how the book came about, how Shinny and I actually met each other and how the book came about. And do you have to turn that off? Even though we're Asian, we're not as technical as we look. Um, so Shinny and I first met at Columbia University in the Qing Dynasty, which was, <laughs> you know, in this case, around the same time as I was a board member in the mid-1990s. Um, but we met under very unfortunate circumstances, which is a spate of suicides by Asian American students. 
And some months after the last funeral, Shinhee and I began to discuss the death of one particular student. Her name was Shuler Yoon, and she was an extremely popular and well-known senior who had just returned to Columbia from her junior year abroad in Paris. Shirley's death really affected Shinhee and me, although neither of us actually knew her personally. I, she wasn't my student, and she wasn't Shinhee's patient. We went to her funeral services, and there were, you know, hundreds of students and friends. But Shinhee and I, along with the university chaplain, who was an African-American woman, we were among a handful of administrators who were at the service. And Shinhee and I found this deeply, deeply unsettling. So in trying to come to terms with Shirley's death, we became absorbed with one particular line in Freud's famous 1917 essay, Mourning and Melancholi Melancholia, which Ken mentioned earlier. And he says in the essay that the melancholic um, knows whom he has lost, but not what he has lost in him. So in trying to understand what we had lost in Shirley, we eventually co-authored an article entitled A Dialogue on Racial Melancholia, which was published in 2000 in a clinical journal called Psychoanalytic Dialogues. And so this is really how the book began. In retrospect, Shinhee and I realized that the classroom and the clinic have functioned as a social barometer of the changing patterns of immigration, racialization, assimilation, of our Asian American students and patients across two generations. So we've been writing now for about 25 years and we've crossed from generation X, our generation, those born between 1960 and 1980 to generation Y, the millennials, those born between 1980 and 2000. So we had passed out a handout um, of the cover of the book, but on the back is a table of contents so you can see, uh, I'm not going to go over it in detail, but you'll see the range of issues that we, c we cover. Um, we start with suicide and depression and model minorities, and then we move to transnational adoption and what we call racial reparation. That's for Generation X. And then in the second half of the book that looks at Generation Y, we discuss parachute kids, and in particular, uh, coming out for parachute kids in our putatively colorblind and gay-friendly world. Today we are bombarded with celebratory discourses of multiculturalism and diversity in the face of ever-increasing racial discord and violence. So in our colorblind age and in the era of same-sex marriage, we lack sufficient critical resources to understand the social and psychic conditions that lead to this contradiction. And equally important, we have very few ways to frame their effects on Asian Americans. So the model minority stereotype, for instance, it represents all Asians as academically successful, as having no problems, as wealthy, exempt from discrimination and distress. But Asian Americans, in fact, are the poorest racial group in New York City. And often discrimination occurs against Asian Americans without any conscious acknowledgement or, or protest. And if we're all, we're in New York City. If you think about some of the recent events like the controversy over um, the SHSAT and the, um, the test to get into Stuyvesant Bronx Science and Specialized High School, you remember that Mayor de Blasio decided to change the test. And he didn't have a single Asian American student or parent or community leader at the table to discuss that. Stuyvesant is 60% Asian American, right? So um, this is, I think, one of the, the ways in which we might think about the lack of understanding or acknowledgement um, on the part of folks in terms of issues that are impacting Asian Americans. And this is as true on the part of politicians as it is on administrators, as faculty, students. But I think most poignantly, you know, on the part of ourselves. And so there's very little work on psychoanalysis and race. There's even less on Asian Americans. So our book really was an attempt, or is an attempt, to address this really palpable absence. It's the first monograph to bring the classroom and the clinic together that focuses specifically on case histories of Asian American adolescents and college students. So while 
Shinny and I really began writing as a way to bind the trauma of those suicides at Columbia, you know, 25 years ago. Ultimately, we wrote the book because we feel an ethical obligation and responsibility to bear witness to and to address the psychic pain and suffering of the various students and patients that we've encountered and worked with over the last two decades. So Shinny's going to move on to the second part, which is about the, the Asian Americans and, and mental health, and then we'll get into the case history. So I forgot to give shout out to my students. Raise your hand. Yay, <laughs> from Colombia, and they're doing amazing things. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Asian American mental health and the clinic. Um, so as David mentioned, we're from the Qing Dynasty, and they still had clinics then. And, um, <laughs> and I have been at about four or five, maybe six uh, university uh, counseling services. At each of those clinics, I was the one and only token minority therapist. Um, and what became very clear immediately at all of these counseling services is that my, I had two missions. One is to reach out and meet the Asian American students who are going through tremendous social and psychic pains and help them, as well as other students of color. But in order to do that, um, the other mission became very clear that I had to recruit a lot of other um, people of color who are competent in providing services. And um, one of the things that remains to be very difficult even today is the second part about recruitment of people of color therapists. That some of the clinic's reactions that I've gotten is, oh, we can't find you know qualified people. Or um, that diversity is a luxury rather than a necessity and that this is untrue that there are a number there are more and more um, people of color going into the field of counseling and I just met two fabulous young therapists and um, we have to really ask this important question while the university is becoming more and more diverse is it, over the generations is it becoming, is it, is it any less segregated? Because it still remains to be a very segregated, segregated space in the university. So one of the examples is that who comes to the clinic? And if you think about like zero to 10 scale and zero, I'm happy, no problem. To 10, I'm suicidal and I'm like seriously not doing well. Um, the white students will seek therapy at around five or six. And this is a generalization, so I'm not saying every single white student who comes in is at five or six. But in overall, the generalization is that they're coming in because they have talked about it with other people, and now they're like, I want a third opinion. I want an objective person who can kind of give me um, some advice. Whereas the Asian American students who come to counseling are at 10 or 11. So they are already reached the threshold of suicidal ideation. They're in the process of planning and having a very clear intent. Sometimes it's actually too late and they must take a medical leave and we cannot help them. And so not only that, for Asian American students, they, are, they don't volunteer. And that oftentimes they're brought by professors and administrators and concerned RAs. For black students, when do they come? They don't feel like it's an entitled space for them. They don't come. And the ones who come, they're very lonely and they're dying to meet somebody who might understand their experience. And oftentimes, there's not a soul who can really kind of hold for them. Um, so for Generation X, we, um, we kind of, for Generation X, um, I think that they came to therapy for depression. Majority of the students were depressed during that period. But the generation Y, they're coming because they're anxious and having panic attacks. So there's a real split between how it transitioned from depression to anxiety. And so we related, we associated Generation X with racial melancholia 
whereas in Generation Y, we associated them with dissociation. So they're very distinct but overlapping psychic mechanisms by which Asian American students um, process the problems of discrimination, exclusion, loss, and grief in relation to their immigration, um, racialization, and assimilation. So we refer to racial melancholia as the histories of racial loss that are condensed. So you can think about like condensed into a forfeited object whose significance must be deciphered for its social meaning. So think about Shirley Yoon that David talked about. We know that we lost Shirley, but we don't know what we lost in her. Um, whereas racial dissociation is referred to as histories of racial, uh, racial loss that are dispersed across a uh, wide social terrain. Um, histories whose social origins and implications remain insistently um, diffuse and obscure. So you can think about condensation for racial melancholia, whereas dispersion is for the dissociation. Another way of thinking about dissociation is through anxiety being everywhere. I mean, who raise your hand if you're not anxious, especially since the election of the orange president. Everybody's anxious. And it's, we don't, we, there is no subject, but it's dispersed everywhere, right? So this is how we came to our title of the book. Um, now I'm going to move into the case history and give you some background about what we're going to talk about. Um, our case study is from the chapter four titled Gay Parachute Kids. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Gay Gay panic attack. They're having panic attacks. Gay panic attack coming out in a colorblind age. And it's important to em emphasize that through our book, uh, we, we try to historicize psychoanalysis. What we mean by that is that we want to think about the history of racial subject in relation to the subject of racial history, um, which is the intro, in, intro to our book. In other words, um, Psychoanalysis really focuses deeply into the histories of the families, histories of the individual, but, but they don't really think about family of nations, us as a community, us as a nation. And so we're constantly moving between um, the history of the racial subject, which is the psychoanalysis, in relation to the subject of racial history, which is the law. So an example would be Asian Americans in relation to immigration, right? So that's how we can t think about it. Um, so as we're thinking about the gay parachute kid in chapter four, raise your hand if you've heard of the term parachute kids. Oh, some of you, but not as many. So just briefly, um, parachute kids are kids, the common story is that there are kids who are um, sent away at a very young age um, to study abroad in the West, to learn English, to get their foot in the door into the American college system. But they can be as young as seven, and they're in boarding schools, they live alone, or they live with a nanny, or they have a mom and dad, mom usually who goes back and forth. Um, but instead of, instead of, um, so, you know, instead of just kind of thinking about them as a singular group who have been sent away, what we realized is that, that they're sent away for a lot of different issues. They're sent away because sometimes they're gay and the parents in Asia don't know what to do. They're embarrassed and they just want to send them away. Some of them are having problems in school and they're given this quote unquote second chance in the West. Um, sometimes you get kind of bad parents who are having a lot of problems and they use the, the parachuting as an alibi to kind of remove the child from the family. And so in some ways, a lot of them are sent away as problems. And if you think about the model minority who's always constituted as a solution, these kids who have been sent away 
are sent away because of a problem. So if we compare them to Du Bois' question to African Americans, how does it feel to be a problem, right? And so in chapter three, we focus on the kids who have been sent away, and we title that Psychic Nowhere. And then in chapter four, we talk about the kids who choose to migrate on their own. And they are the gay kids um, who are self-determined, highly motivated, highly successful students who choose to migrate because they want to live a free life in the West. Um, so I'm going to give you an excerpt of Christopher, who I met um, during his senior year in college. He's a very ambitious, gay, Chinese parachute kid um, who came because of panic attacks. He was having very severe panic attacks. He thought that he was having a brain tumor and that he would die for sure. Um, and he realized in sixth grade in China that he was different. He said, I'm gay and I can't live in China. I can't embarrass my parents. So at a very young age, he made this major decision about his life to move to the West so that he could live a free life. So he worked really hard, and in eighth grade, he got a scholarship to Singapore. And from there, he came to New York for college. Um, what's really perplexing about Christopher and the other um, gay parachute kids is that while they're very driven, um, their homophobia and racism remain largely tangential. And it, it doesn't really connect to their panic attacks. It's as though they're very dissociated between what is happening to them and the issues at large for them, right? So for Generation X, they precisely came to therapy because of racism and homophobia. But for Generation Y, it's, it's a mystery and it's like not an issue for them, okay? So what's all the panic about? Um, we can think about it in a couple of ways. Um, on one hand, it, it, it can be read like a gay mystery novel. Who killed homophobia? On the other hand, from a racial perspective, we can ask, what are the psychic structures of uh, color blindness among millennials today? So now I'm going to read you the case history, uh, like an abbreviated version on Christopher. Uh, in college, Christopher studied nonstop. He conformed to a rigid daily schedule, and every semester he packed his classes with an overload of credits. He reported that he slept no more than four to five hours a night, limited eating two meals per day, and devoted the rest of his waking hours to studying and planning his future. During winter and spring recess, while some of his friends traveled back to China to visit his family, visit their family or go on vacation, he stayed in the dorm and continued to study. Each summer, instead of returning home to see his parents, Christopher interned at prestigious uh, financial firms in Wall Street. He studied the habitus of white bankers as if he were a graduate student in anthropology, absorbing their mannerisms, dispositions, interest in sports teams, I had a lot to do with that because I'm obsessed with sports and use of language. He compiled an extensive list of the social cultural differences between the self and other. As I learned more about Christopher's personal history, I offered an interpretation of his panic attacks as an acute warning for him to slow down and take care of himself emotionally, physically, and, and spiritually. Christopher had channeled all of his energy toward intellectual development at the expense of his emotional well-being and mental health. Indeed, this fact was quite obvious in Christopher's physical appearance. His head resembled a large boulder on top of a long skinny neck, skinny stick. When I asked Christopher how easy it was to hold a large stone on a stick, he chuckled and replied, I guess my head was about to fall off. He then added, whenever I felt a panic attack coming on, it started with a killer headache. I felt like my head could explode. I was so scared that it would blow up. Kaboom. Christopher began to assess his numerous sacrifices over the years since leaving China at eighth grade. 
He admitted to poor dietary habits, skipping meals and eating cheap instant ramen several times per week so as to lessen the financial burden on his parents. He had not seen his parents in person, only virtually, for many years. He became quite saddened when he realized that in college, he had stopped feeding his mind and spirit with literature and philosophy, his mother's gift to him, replacing them instead with a quantitative double major in science and math. Equally devastating in his relationship with his boyfriend, Matt. Um, so the way that Matt came about in our um, conversation in sessions is that instead of coming out and saying, I'm gay and I have a boyfriend named Matt, he just talked about, oh, my boyfriend and I, you know, we're together, we're both parachute kids. So in the conversation that I understood that he was gay and that he was in a relationship. So in his um, relationship with his boyfriend, Matt, both had made a pact to work together as a collective team, consciously suppressing their sexual appetites and scheduling their romantic encounters for rare special occasions. So Matt is also a parachute kid who came from Shanghai, then to migrated to Canada before coming to New York, and he's also in finance. Um, while there was a bounty of anxiety in Christopher's life, there was a deficit of spontaneity, no creativity. He was an automaton. Like many high-achieving millennials, his was an inordinately planned and scheduled life. At the beginning of his treatment, Christopher believed that every question and problem could be solved rationally and intellectually. With this technocratic attitude, he rejected all feelings as unreliable and unnecessary. As his treatment progressed and his reflections deepened, Christopher realized that he had firmly believed from a very young age he was doing the quote-unquote right thing and that constant sacrifice was necessary in order to become successful in life. I asked him what he meant by a successful life. Poignantly, Christopher responded, I guess I meant financial success, but I forgot my goal of living a free life in the US as a gay person. It all just became work and more work. What's the point of living here if I'm a robot? Robots don't have a sexual orientation. I'm basically asexual. The emergence of this self-awareness led to several bouts of crying and recollections of earlier dreams of living a happy life with a good partner in New York, while not burdening his parents in Beijing with the possible embarrassment of his sexual orientation. I used to care about being happy. I didn't even realize that I was unhappy until the panic attacks told me so. It struck me that Christopher embodied an, an, an updated neoliberal version of the model minority stereotype under globalization. Unlike many stressed out model minorities with overbearing helicopter parents, Christopher's stress was largely self-imposed. From the beginning of therapy and despite advice from his psychiatrist, Christopher refused medication to treat his panic attacks. What is interesting to note is that from the first session until the end of his five-month treatment, Christopher never experienced another panic attack. He said putting his feelings into language and identifying his problems felt very empowering to him. As his talking cure progressed, Christ Christopher's language noticeably shifted from thinking to feeling. With his fears of premature death dissipating, Christopher became more open up to my suggestions to learn some basic restorative yoga moves. He began attending yoga classes to learn more breathing, stretching, and meditative techniques. After his first yoga lesson, Christopher reported that it was the hardest class he has ever taken in his life because he had to use his mind body and spirit together rather than compartmentalize them as he had done before.
So let me talk a little bit um, about the case history and give you a quick critical commentary. So there are three broad issues that Shinhee and I explore in the book in general, which I want to relate to Christopher's specific psychic predicament and case history. So the first thing that we explore is that in moving from generation X to generation Y, we also go from a second generation to a first generation model. So this is to say, when I was um, in college, if I was with other Asian kids, invariably, we were all second generation. Our parents were the immigrants, and we were model minorities. We did well in school. Uh, upward, um, higher education was our upward mo mobility. But because of the real capital accumulation in Asia that has led to this phenomenon of parachuting, today when I teach my Asian American studies course, I would say at least half the students are first generation. And this movement from X to Y, from second to first generation, is a very, I think, important uh, shift demographically that I want to think about in relation to Christopher. So that's point one. The second is I wanted to talk a little bit more about racial dissociation and elaborate it as both a social and psychic mechanism, and specifically in terms of what Shinhee and I describe in the book, not just as dissociation, but racial dissociation. And then the third thing I want to do is conclude by returning to something that Shinhee had already mentioned, which is the way in which we toggle back and forth between the history of the racial subject, psychoanalysis, and the subject of racial history, which is law. So let me start with the first point, which is this movement from a second to a first generation model. So think about it, all first generation immigrants are colorblind, in a sense. Um, I think about my parents who came here as grad students. They grew up as part of the majority in China. So like the Han majority or you're part of the Hindu majority. And you come to a culture where suddenly you're a minority and you don't know the racial history, you don't know the protocols, um, and you don't have a really a vocabulary to talk about race and racism. So in this sense, for first generation immigrants, people fresh off the boat, um, racial discourse is both too early and too late for you. So our genealogy of colorblindness in the United States is one that's very much attached to law. So we're officially in a colorblind society because the Supreme Court withdrew from the regulation of the separation of races in the public and the private sphere. Right? So in 54, Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court declared legalized segregation in the public realm of education to no longer be constitutionally permissible. And then in 1967, some years later, um, in Loving versus Virginia, the Supreme Court declared that the legalized separation of black and white in marriage was no longer constitutional. So this is what legally we mean by our colorblind moment, right? The state withdrawing from the, the, the state-sanctioned separation of the races in, in education and in marriage, in public and in private. But the history that I'm telling you right now, which is about an entire generation of parachute kids who are coming at a very, very young age to study here, who don't have the vocabulary and the history, this is a completely different uh, story around colorblindness that's not really attached to histories of African-American slavery and constitutional law. And it's something that I think really needs to be factored in and thought about in terms of ethnic studies and in terms of a kind of comparative racial framework. I don't know if you guys have been following all the affirmative action debates, but Renee Tajami Pena, who is a longtime Asian American um, filmmaker, activist, she had an amazing essay in the Washington Post talking about how the failure of understanding affirmative action is the failure of understanding ethnic studies. Right, so when you think about black and white dynamics, which more or less frame our understanding of race, um, that binary is, is, is unsustainable the minute you put Asian Americans into the picture. So think black, white, victim, perpetrator. The minute you put in Asians, are Asians victims, or are they perpetrators, right? So it's a much more complicated landscape that is about comparative race. And part of our book really is trying to explore the question of how Asians fit in within a diverse and a multicultural and a multiracial landscape. So 
let me talk about the second point now, which is about the question of dissociation and more specifically racial dissociation. So when we say dissociation, a lot of times people just think about it as a negative thing. But in fact, the theorists of dissociation talk about it as both a productive and a pathological condition. So we're all dissociated. Um, when I'm here with Shinhee doing a public lecture, I show one side of my personality. When I'm teaching, I show a different side of my personality. If I'm at a job interview with strangers or a cocktail party with strangers, I, I show a different side of my personality. You know, with a, when I'm with really um, friends and loved ones, I, I show a different side of my personality. So we're all dissociated, and the difference between being adaptive or being pathological is from all of these different aspects of yourself, are you able to create the healthy illusion of a unified meanness? If you can do that, then you're dissociating in a positive or a healthy way. But if from all these different pieces, you can't assemble a healthy illusion of self, then it's pathological. And Philip Bromberg, who is one of the premier theorists of dissociation, he has this brilliant essay called Standing in the Spaces. And that's the idea that he uses. It means that if you're doing it properly, you can stand in multiple spaces and still sustain a sense of yourself. And if you can't do it well, then you're unable to stand in those multiple spaces. So this is dissociation as a psychic mechanism, but I wanted to, us to think about it as a social mechanism and in particular as a racial mechanism. So how do we socialize dissociation to think about problems of race and racism? Think about the racial stereotype, for instance. It indexes the problem of being prevented from standing in multiple spaces. Michelle Stevens, who's an absolutely brilliant African-American psychoanalyst, and she's also the dean of humanities at Rutgers, she makes this point concerning dissociation. It's not an intra, but in fact, it's an intersubjective relationship. And she talks about the way in which um, racial dissociation emerges from not being able to reconcile the visions you have of yourself with the visions that others have of you, right? And think about something like the stereotype of the black male. You think of yourself as not a criminal. If you walk into a store, everyone thinks of you as a criminal. So that's a kind of just really shorthand way of understanding how the vision that you have of yourself versus the vision that other people have of you can create a situation in which you can't stand in multiple spaces. So that's one way that we start to move from the psychic paradigm to the social paradigm and from the psychic paradigm to the racial paradigm of racial dissociation. So let's think about um, Christopher. And I'm going to read you a page or two of our analysis of him in relation to these issues. Christopher leads an extraordinarily compartmentalized and dissociated existence. He cannot easily stand in the multiple spaces of his life. Christopher is academically accomplished, a model minority by all appearances, but his body is in pieces. Oriented only toward work and more work, rather than present needs and desires, Christopher suffers bodily deprivation as well as insufficient contact with his lover, family, and friends. He has an inordinately planned and scheduled existence, one marked by a deficit of spontaneity. It is no surprise that when he began to attend yoga classes in an attempt to reassemble his body to learn how to breathe, stretch, meditate, and be present to himself, he described it as, quote, unquote, the hardest class he had ever taken in his life was because he had to use his mind, body, and spirit together rather than compartmentalize them as he used to do. Christopher's case history provides a detailed example of how neoliberal anxieties concerning financial precarity, work, and employment organize discourses of race and sex today. Christopher comes to the U.S. to live a free life as a gay man. He has a nice Chinese boyfriend, but they don't have sex. On the face of it, his psychic struggles seem not to concern issues of sexuality or race much at all. Problems connected to homophobia and racism are not significant aspects of Christopher's self-narration. Nonetheless, Christopher, like prior generations of Asian Americans before him, seems quite aware of not only his sexual but also his racial otherness, especially in the space of his Wall Street financial firm. 
Indeed, his actions at work suggest that in order to stand in the space of a high-powered Wall Street environment, he must disavow both his homosexuality and race. Christopher studies the habitus of the white male investment banking world as if he were a graduate student in anthropology. While Christopher is a part of his Wall Street world, he's also apart from it. Similarly, although Christopher seems somewhat nonchalant about his homosexuality, he deliberately keeps his sexual orientation separate from both his high-profile work group as well as his parents. I forgot my goal of living a free life in the U.S. as a gay person, he states. It all just became work and more work. What's the point of living here if I'm a robot? Robots don't have a sexual orientation. I'm basically asexual. In a colorblind and multicultural world, and with the steady rise of capital accumulation in Asia, one is no longer required to pass as white or to pass as straight in order to partake in the benefits of global capitalism. Christopher is not passing as a white person, a straight person, or even a human person. Instead, Christopher's unhealthy version of dissociation takes the form of passing as a robot, valued only for his productive capacity for work and more work. The automaton marks the dream of a neoliberal world order, a paragon of productivity and efficiency, and tellingly, a homo economicus devoid of racial difference or sexual desire. Moreover, the automaton is a figure without history. With no past, present, or future, the robot is not only about efficiency without sex, but also outside lived histories of institutionalized racism and homophobia, devoid of the sticky liabilities of social difference and demand. In this manner, the automaton is a made-to-order witness for a neoliberal economic world order, marking a new form of racial and sexual exclusion in a colorblind age precisely by having no relation to these formative historical categories. Importantly, Christopher as a neoliberal automaton is a self-regulating subject. For Generation X, the concept of gay panic attacks was associated with the unwarranted violence that homophobes directed against homosexuals. In contrast, for Christopher and other gay members of Generation Y, panic attacks index a very different psychic phenomenon. Rather than signaling external physical assaults directed against gays and lesbians, these are internal psychic assaults experienced by gay millennials as a form of self-discipline. This neoliberal regulation of self begins to explain how panic attacks against gays in a prior generation have been tra transformed into gay panic attacks. If you look at the title, we have gay in parentheses. Attacks by the self against the self in an age of colorblindness and queer neoliberalism. We might describe Christopher's condition of sexual and racial dissociation as one fundamental structure of colorblindness today. So let me move to the third point and just wrap up, which is, about this subject of racial history. So I think that the important thing to remember in a colorblind world um, is that while public discrimination by the state has been banned, the law says nothing about private discrimination. So there's a critical legal theorist named, um, critical race theorist named Neil Gotanda, who says, quote, all racial discrimination in the private sphere is constitutionally permissible. So think about the Boy Scouts. Right, the Boy Scouts is a private organization and say, we don't want any gay troop leaders. So we have to remember that in, under neoliberalism today, the, the whole move of neoliberalism is predicated on the principle that an ever greater number of public state functions ca can and should be outsourced to the private sphere. So as the public sphere continues to shrink, and as the private sphere continues to grow and overshadow all aspects of our life, the space for private discrimination also expands through the privileged language of individual choice. So the way that I explain this to my students is I talk about internet dating. I'm like, on, with internet dating, you can customize a partner, right? You can choose age, weight, height, race, religion, education, politics, background, down to the square pound an inch, right? People would never say that this is racism or homophobia. They just say it's your per personal preference. And I think that that's one of the big shifts 
from Generation X, which is really the generation, the tail end of civil rights, to Generation Y, which is now this story around diversity and multiculturalism. But you know, when I talk to the students, people still understand, right? Especially given our political environment today, that race matters. But the question is like, how do we start to explain this to one another? So I think that the most important thing is to understand how Christopher shows us that racism is reconfigured in the language of individual choice outside of history. And from this perspective, actually, we're all, our entire political and legal system is premised on dissociation and everybody in a colorblind age is dissociated. Um, but of course, the effects of that are very different on different communities and populations. Um, so in other words, conscious overt sexism and racism have been replaced by more subtle and unconscious forms of homophobia and racial hostility. They're psychically effective and politically charged precisely because they proliferate without conscious acknowledgement or a kind of critical vocabulary for us to discuss it. So I always say this to the students as well, colorblindness is not the absence of racism or homophobia. Colorblindness is the precise form in which racism and homophobia appear to us today. And this, we argue, is what all the panic is about. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what it was like to co-write this book together, especially over such a long time. And I'm curious how coming at this from different disciplinary backgrounds, you kind of made that writing process work. Um, Crystal, thanks for that hard question. Crystal was in my class last year, and she's going to Berkeley for a PhD. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Um, so we, as David said, we met over uh, our own mourning process. And um, we actually uh, um, happened to be at a bar, like two or three in the morning, and talking about Freud's um, essay and just exploring what this all means, right? And some guy next to us was, I guess, eaves eavesdropping. And he said, wow, you guys should write about it. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And literally, that's how it began. He brought us drinks. Oh, he brought us drinks, too. OK. Um, and you know, I go to bed at 9.30, but back then, um, I could stay up uh, quite a bit. So, um, so David and I um, generally um, have come together about five years to write each. Um, Every five years? Yeah, each, each article. And the way we generally write is that the first one, um, it was very difficult because we've never written together and we have very different writing and speaking styles. And um, so it was very difficult, but we did try, we did stay together the whole time and wrote word for word. Yeah, I we think. became friends. Oh, yeah, we became friends. <laughs> but um, after that, what. <laughs> This is like giving birth. So we're not together, but we did give birth to a book. So after it's that, it's no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After that, um, generally, what we actually discovered is that what what David was experiencing with the students in the classroom and what I was experiencing in the clinic paralleled one another. And so the chapter two, which is on transnational adoption, adoption. Um, David was talking about students who were coming out to him in class, and that I was also seeing a Not number. Not as gay or lesbian. But, but as, uh, as adoptees. And I was beginning to see more and more um, transnational adoptees. And so we started to really kind of talk about um, what does it mean to have a birth mother, an adopted mother, uh, 
a nation that is both birth country and an adopted country. And we began to really talk about what kind of um, psychoanalytic readings would help us to explore those kinds of things. And then so every five years, you know, the thing is life happens. And so when we wrote that I was pregnant and then, then years go by and then we're like, oh gosh, we're seeing all these like kids who are like, you know, like alone. And I and in the clinic, they're like, oh, where are you coming from? And they're like, well, I grew up in the boarding school by myself since age seven, and you know, I've been alone. And and so then we started to talk about them. So the way that we write is that we'll kind of think about number of case histories and what is really compelling, and it's also generalizable to other um, Asian Americans. And then we'll start reading, and then we'll start to come up with ideas about how to really apply and um, go in that kind of order, right? Okay. Chris, I'll, thanks to that. I mean, I'll say something really quickly, which is that issues of race and racism, of immigration, of sexual violence, of climate change today, these are such huge social problems. There's no one discipline or person who is adequate or capable of addressing them. And I really think about Shinhee and my collaboration over the last 25 years as a small attempt for us to come together to try to think um, more seriously and more deeply about the problem of race and Asian Americans. Um, and so it's not always easy, but what's interesting is that we come to psychoanalysis from these very different perspectives. Shinhee's a clinician. I'm a theorist in the humanities. And so when we talk to each other, sometimes stuff makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. But it's the stuff that doesn't make sense that actually often pushes you to try to understand the problem in a better way. Um, I feel like my, in my relationship with Shinhi, what I've come to learn myself is stuff that you don't know you tend to idealize or romanticize. So I always thought of the clinic as a kind of more idealized space where students could have the time to try to work through things that, let's say, in classes they can't. And Shinny was always just like, fool, that's not right. And I think I, the, the example that she gave you, you know, about is the university is more and more diverse, but is it any less segregated? And so this whole idea that the clinic, right, has a whole kind of segregated hierarchy where white students feel entitled to the space. Asian students are dragged in there. Latino and black students don't feel entitled to it at all. The clinic and the classroom and the university are no more and no less segregated from the rest of the world. And each of these spaces are a reflection of those things, right? The, the, the clinic reflects the classroom, reflects the university, which reflects the social world that we live in today. And so these kind of collaborations, I think, have also made me um, much, much smarter about what the role of therapy is or what the limits of therapy uh, might be in terms of providing a cure. Because when we say this in the, in the end, unless and until there's a more just world, these problems are not gonna disappear and they'll just keep on reappearing in the clinic. But it does matter whether you have a clinician who understands that and is not trying to like stitch you back into a world that is fundamentally unjust or making you feel like you shouldn't be feeling that this is unjust. Hi. What's your name? Yeah, my name is Hope. Hi, Hope. And I was in class with Crystal with Dr. Han. What? Um, <laughs> You're all my students. <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, so I, I teach in Philadelphia, I forgot. Right. Welcome to our city. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I have a question about the fate of this dissociated generation that you've described in your work, um, specifically as relates to uh, what you've described in Christopher's journey as like, you know, as he did yoga and sort of like, as he assembled his body, he was also reassembling his, uh, his identity in some sense. Um, but there, there seems to me to be a slight, uh, how should I put this, a, a slight uh, gap in discovering sort of ethnic identity in relationship to 
um, this like dissociation that we find ourselves in. So like the fate of the dissociated generation, especially in regards to like there being some sort of language or cultural gap between generation X and generation Y and the generations preceding and like how trauma sort of lives in our bodies, you know, immigrant trauma, you know, as a Korean, like war trauma from our grandparents, et cetera. So um, I feel like the description of the situation has been pretty well exposited, but is there, you know, a way forward, a path forward for dissociated uh, people such as ourselves? Hope, what happened to you? No. <laughs> 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 I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not even sure that I can like begin to unravel what you just asked. Um, but you know, in terms of um, ethnic identity, in for Christopher, that's not a, a problem because he knows that he's Chinese. And the other thing that he had is um, before he parachuted from China to New York. He parachuted to Singapore, which is another majority nation where Asian people are. And so his identity as an Asian and also as a gay person there, which I didn't read, um, was al also kind of concealed and, and formulated there. And that his identity development was quite um, secure and um, prosperous. It's only when he came to New York and he realized, or he he saw in the Wall Street world that he was a minority, that he was an outsider, that he began to really, or he, he realized that at the college that he began to compartmentalize into pieces and beginning to have these dissociated, um, um, unadaptive and pathological dissociations, right, as a way of a survival skill. So. Um, you know, I think that David's description of the the ways in which we can be dissociated is a very good um, s tool for us to think about, um, which is, hey, do I have an adaptive meanness where I can kind of utilize me in different ways? If I'm having a hard time, can I bring in the other parts of me as my resource to help me get through this difficult period? So that is that kind of unity, uh, illusion of a unity that we can always rely on. So I have an example of a South African student that I'm, start, I'm seeing. She's an amazing performer. She sings, dances, plays the drums. But whenever she has to give a class presentation, she completely dissociates and can't remember anything. And one of the things that we're talking about is, hey, you're a performer. Can you bring in your parts of you that is the dancer and the drummer and the singer and really utilize that in the class presentation, right? So the, clinically, that's how I would approach it, that a that lot of the students that I'm seeing right now are in the pathological dissociated state where they, they're so split that they don't even know each other in the meanness, right? And in clinical situation, um, the idea is to really utilize all of you mm. and to be able to create a wholeness. I mean, I'll say that as a psychic mechanism, people talk about dissociation as actually one of the hardest psychic conditions to cure. And unlike depression, where you're able to on a very low kind of energy level, narrate uh, your predicament. When you're having a panic attack, you're basically in psychosis, right? So that um, under those conditions, there's really nothing to do other than try to stop a student from harming his or herself. On another level, I had mentioned, I think, Winnicott, or maybe I didn't earlier, but a lot of dissociation is built on Winnicott, D.W. Winnicott's theories of true self and false self. And false self is about, it's not, it's not like, oh, there's a, a, a true me and a false me. It's really about emotion. So in the way that Christopher doesn't have spontaneity, a true self has spontaneity, a false self doesn't. And what Winnicott says is, when you're addressing a false self personality, you can only get to the true self through the false self. But because the false self is so compliant, Anytime a therapist tries to intervene, 
the patient is just willing to say, yes, 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 I agree with you, I agree with you, I agree with you, but they don't change their position. So I was really, we, in the book, we, we were really thinking about this in relation to the model minority myth and that the way in which we're socialized, our social contract is to be model minorities, our social contract is to be colorblind, our social contract is to be compliant, and that, that socialized training of compliance actually as a clinical condition of dissociation is a very, very hard condition to cure. So how do you think about it, not let's say on the individual level, how do you think about it on the collective level? And I think that there are two examples here. On the collective level, it's extremely hard because one of the things you see with Christopher is that he's kind of a Chinese nationalist, right? He, is a, he's, he's a, he comes from the majority in China, he goes to Singapore, which is a multicultural environment, but he kind of reassembles a group of Chinese parachute kids there, and he comes to New York, and in college, he does the same thing. And what we're living today, broadly, is in societies where you, you know, US nationalism, Chinese nationalism, um, Indian nationalism is on the rise. And so, in some sense, you know, his defense against his, this uncomfortable position could be turning not to a greater consciousness of the ways in which race, racism, nationalism function, but kind of turning to Chinese nationalism as a kind of solution. And what I would say here then is that it really goes back to questions of consciousness raising. So in ch the chapter on psychic nowhere, we have a case history of a young man named Jung, who is also from China. And unlike the gay guys who choose to go away, he's a, one person who has been sent away and he has a very, very hard time. And what happens is he actually meets an Asian American girlfriend. And the girlfriend has the vocabulary around histories of race and racism. She has the history of growing up in the United States. She has a kind of consciousness around these issues. And she functions almost as a transition object for him to kind of get into a different psychic state. And so I would say that particular case history maybe is an example of the way in which dissociation gets kind of ameliorated in a more progressive um, way, but in the same sense that we talked about how all of these different spaces, whether it's the classroom or the clinic or the university, are no more or less segregated, there are other spaces like the Asian American Writers' Workshop. In my opening comments, I, 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 I really was sincere when I said I've seen it again and again where young people come in here to try to just be creative and to start writing, but it's through that creativity and writing that they form a consciousness and they form a community. So I think one of the big problems with psychoanalysis, it's always thought about on the individual level, but we can't think about it on the individual level. We have to think about it on the group level because we live in a society in relation to others, right? So we have to think a field that's profoundly about the individual and the individual's cure in, in relation to this much larger group. And again, I think that that's the point that we're trying to make in saying we want to think about the history of the racial subject in relation to the subject of racial history. Hi. Hi, Misha. Um, I just wanted you to, it, Misha, um, I just wanted you to expound, if you could, I, because the question that's coming to my mind now is so if you find this consciousness then does it lead to the non-compliance is that is because if compliance is the thing that's holding you back right and then you're raising your level of consciousness are you going to then become non-compliant and is that going to um where would that lead as we kind of like going along with with down the path so i'll give you an example when we went to shirley yoon's um funeral and David and I started to um, become friends and try to mourn. One of the things that I said earlier is that I had to like become very uh, much of like I had to fight and say we need more people of color at the clinic. Okay, so that became non-compliant, right? And my director at that point told me, "You're causing a lot of problem." And this is not a model minority behavior is to the extent that he said. And he said, you're hanging out with um, David Eng too much. <laughs> and um, I don't know if I told you this. No, you didn't. Oh. And, oh, you're making uh, that up. I'm not making that up. I have nothing and but an ameliorative effect on 
<laughs> you did. So I left, <laughs> I left the director. Um, <laughs> I left the boss. But I did fight. And I did um, hold uh, like a two-week resistance and didn't go to work. And um, so, yes, once you become, once that consciousness is raised, right? So that's why I've been fighting for 30 years in the clinics, is because you can't be compliant once you know that um, this has been woken to you, right? Um, and that it can start with me alone and then a friend. We can start a group. Um, David was telling these lovely young therapists to be, start a group, start a support group. And that's how we create a community. Holly's Giving Circle started with a few people. Hey, we, we actually had a, what's called a gay, and the four of us would go out for lunch once a month and go shopping. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then it- Social activism. Yes. Consumerism. And then it evolved into, hey, where are we giving money to for charity? And Holly said, well, why don't we like unite it and start giving it to people of color organizations? That is the consciousness, right? So social activism, once you become woke, can happen with yourself and then with the next person and then the next person. And so this space, I think, socially and psychically, is our home and that's why it's been so special and ken has done an amazing job of of really being generous and being open to all of us to always come and that's where that's where we are and this is our community whether it's been your first time or a millionth time this is a home base and this is our community and the consciousness can be spread from here on Um, let me let me say something really quickly to Misha, which is to say, um, psychoanalytically, melancholia when it's singular, the anger and the protest is turned inward toward the self, and it's about the destruction of the self. But when um, melancholia is collectivized and turned outward, right, then it come it becomes social protest, and I think that that's a kind of thought and a paradigm that was developed very much in relation to the era that we were growing up around AIDS and a whole generation of young men who were dying who had no kind of public, there was no way to publicly mourn them, right? So that, that was one, I think, historical example of the way in which melancholia was not, let's say, racialized, but sexualized and turned against the self. And so, yes, I think that the consciousness raising um, and the breaking of compliance often should and, and can, can and should lead to protest. But of course, then that gets you into a lot of trouble because whenever you want to change the structure and the status quo, especially, let's say, very locally of the liberal university, then you're in trouble. I always say this just very matter-of-factly to my colleagues and to administrators at Penn. Penn is now 26% Asian American. We have three faculty working in the field of Asian American studies for 26% of the student population. Just in the English department, we have three medievalists. We have four early modernists. We have three 18th century people. We have, a, I don't mean, I can't even keep track of how many modernists we have. But the in the entire university, there are three people for 25, 26% of the student population. I mean, I'm not a bean counter, but in a liberal democracy, that would never be tolerated for any other group. But for Asian Americans, it is just every day. And so I think that maybe that's why, you know, people are saying you, I should, you shouldn't hang out with me. <laughs> but that's just an empirical fact. And that means that there is something wrong there. And I think that Going around the block and kind of being old now, um, what you realize is that the change is incremental and you take two steps forward and one step back. Because the landscape, honestly, is not that much more different from when you and I began to now. Although it's, it's, it is arguably better. Yeah. What's your name? VJ. VJ, hi. Thank you guys so much for your talk. Um, I think I'm, 
I'm interested in the direction that the Q and A has taken regarding um, like we're, what we're calling like consciousness raising and, and non-compliance. Because I guess like when you guys were talking about Christopher, I was like, I don't know, the yoga thing kind of felt like. Like, is that it, you know? Because it was, like, you, you, because you situated what Christopher was going through, right, structurally, like, with, like, the, I don't know, like, the uh, neoliberal conception of, like, work culture or, or whatever. And then it's, like, it ends with, like, kind of, like, a self-care routine. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and I'm wondering um, how that, I guess, intersects with the ethics of, like, the mental health space because it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of individualistic kind of thing. Um, but do you think it's your job? Do you think that it's useful to redirect these kinds of um, uh, symptoms of dissociation and anxiety towards the structural antagonism as opposed to just coming up with a coping mechanism? That's a really good question. Um, so. He was in a more or less brief treatment, and he came in, you know, no one goes to therapy because they're having a racial problem, and no one goes to therapy because they're just kind of hanging out and they want to know more about themselves. They're usually in a crisis. So Christopher coming in is a very typical way of entering therapy because he thought he was dying, right? So number, uh, the first level of treatment is generally the symptom, symptom alleviation, right? And that you, otherwise you can't really get to the underlying issues at all. So the symptom um, alleviation was really about his dissociated self. And it really, I mean, not that I recommend yoga to everyone, but it was a necessity for his survival to kind of glue himself back together so that we could actually then talk. Um, so yoga is a metaphor for that, right, in a way, like gluing him back together and so that the boulder doesn't fall off. But from there, the things that obviously we didn't share is that there is the underlying issues, right? He is a very, like what Freud would call this tremendous super ego, right, where everything is I should and I have to. So it's a complete demand of the self, and it's overpowering. And so there is the superego, ego, and the id. And they're supposed to have kind of an equal parts to each other to manage and balance and, and negotiate and compromise. And especially the ego structure is a way in which one can um, mediate between superego and the impulse, which is the id. But he has no id. He has no impulse. There's no spontaneity. There's no like fun. It's just all like 80% super ego and maybe 20% ego somewhere there. So the, the rest of the work is really about kind of helping him to, to bring in the ego strengths as well as the id so that the boyfriend and he can have fun night together or, um, or that the should can be managed better so that he can actually like kind of see himself as a whole person right and then from there there are like and so dissociation is a defensive mechanism right so that's still like in the kind of somewhere in between the two and then from the structural that that structural shift is a very long process and that he's probably still working on that yeah, that's a that's a really I think great and important question, and I think that the the question that you raise is a question that really emphasizes the difference between the space of the clinic and the space of the classroom, because you know Shinhee in trying to treat someone with a panic attack has a very different set of demands, responsibilities, obligations than let's say I do in the classroom, and I actually do think that it is my job in the classroom to conscious raise. Um, and the thing that I always say, for instance, to my colleagues is that, you know, people get very good teaching evaluations for very bad reasons. And people get really bad teaching evaluations for very good reasons. And a lot of that has to do with gender, sexuality, race, but a lot of it actually has to do with whether or not you are challenging students in the classroom to rethink the way in which they see the world. And that is, can be very alarming, and it can be very destabilizing 
And I always say to the students, look, you know, I don't think about teaching as a one semester project. I think of it as a lifelong project. It is far more important to me that you write to me five, 10 years from now when I don't even remember you and say, you know, I didn't, I, th I didn't understand this or I didn't like the class or I didn't like what you were saying, but now I understand many, many years later. And so that's always been my philosophy around pedagogy. So it's, it's, it's um, naive to say that politics don't exist in the clinic, that they don't exist in the classroom. They do. It's just a question of whether or not you're actually willing to call them out and whether you're willing to say to the students, look, this is a choice that you make. Do you want to be part of the problem or do you want to be part of the solution? And I do think that that is fundamental to, uh, uh, to being an educated adult and to understanding and, and to having a consciousness that if this is what you're doing, at least you're consciously choosing to do it. So I would just add that I think we have to actually um, end. It's about it's almost eight thirty. Yeah, we have dinner reservations. Yeah. We got we're Asian people. We have to eat. Uh, <laughs> but I would just add that um, there are a lot of patients that I've seen over the uh, really long time, um, and many of them like randomly will send me a note, and um, and I don't know always that I've helped them or what it meant for them to be in therapy because my experience i might feel like oh god i didn't do a good job but i get a letter saying you really saved my life and so um i think that that one of the things that's really important is that connection and that they that christopher entrusted himself in in our work right and one of the things that it, um we had to get a uh, consent to be able to uh, write about them. And both Christopher and this other um, student, Neil, as well as some other s people, they've all really told us that I hope that my case history really helps other people. So again, that conscious raising of bringing the community together, and it's about saving lives. And as David said earlier, it's about, it's, we wrote it because of our ethical obligation not because we want to be famous. Okay, we do want to make a lot of money, so. Uh, <laughs> so buy the book, then we'll be really rich. Buy it for anniversaries, birthdays, divorces. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's really about um, the classroom, the space like here, and one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, in that sense, I think the classroom and the clinic are similar, which is that you reach certain people, certain people, have a more transformative experience. Other people don't, right? It's, it, it is, these are all spaces where there's a relationality between the therapist and the patient or between the, the, the professor and the student. Um, but you were saying we have to go to dinner, so should we just take one more question yeah, one more. and then call it a day? Yeah. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this book. I think it's a big contribution. Um, since you're mostly discussing um, college students, young adults, um, and I appreciate Vijay's question about that as well. But what's the extrapolation, and I don't know if the book addresses this, as far as beyond the young adult stage, given the melancholia, given the dissociation, in that am I to extrapolate that um, most of Asian America is depressed and still in that stage, developmentally retarded, et cetera, of melancholia and dissociation? That's a really good question. So as I get older, I'm also seeing older Asian Americans. And I would say I have a lot of um, people that I saw in college. And then they go into the workforce. And about five years later, they're having an identity crisis, and they come back. And then another five years or so, they get into a serious relationship. Some, get, some have children, and then they come back. And they want to change careers, and they come back. So I've seen some people over the last 20 years and um, from period to period of their um, developmental milestones. And I think that it's what's interesting just clinically is that um, the Generation X that I've been working with since then, um, they, they, are, they still experience depression. But I would say that they're also dissociated. There's just so much going on and they have to um, straddle so many multiple things and that the anxiety, the dispersion of that anxiety and the dissociation is very, very present.
and that we're all, as David said, we're all dissociated. And the only thing that, that I can really recommend is make sure that you know each other, like inside of you, <laughs> and talk to each other inside of you so that you have that illusion of a unity. Otherwise, it's extremely easy to split and forget and be completely pathologically dissociated. Yeah. Not everyone is dissociated. We write about, I mean, you know, we write about the ones who are for the book, but they're also very well adjusted Asian American I, I people. don't see that, <laughs> so that's why. <laughs> So anyway, it's, it's uh, a skewed population. Uh, we want to thank Ken and Holly again and the Writers' Workshop and thank all of you. It's yeah. been such a great audience so and fun. we love your energy. And I love seeing so many young people. And actually, I don't have to see old people. I mean, I, every year I get a renewal of 17-year-olds, you know. So anyway, good night. Thank you.